it's on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And uh, I have I have trouble getting into TV shows, but this one I like. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just uh, getting everyone in. <laughs> All right. Looks like everyone is in and ready to go. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Tonight we have author Toby Pearl uh, speaking about uh, her book, Terror to the Wicked. Toby Pearl earned degrees in law and international relations from Boston University, and she studied international law at the University of Hong Kong. Terror to the Wicked is her first book, and she lives with her husband, uh, also an author, Matthew Pearl, three children, and her rescue dog. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Toby. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. This is an absolute pleasure. And I've been very excited for this event. Um, folks who are in Kingston um, will realize that they're very close to uh, where the events in my book originally unfolded. And um, I'm happy to kind of jump right in and um, share a little bit about how I first came across these events and the research that went into the book. Um, so about five years ago, um, after the birth of my third child, I became interested in my family's genealogy. And as a holiday gift, my husband bought me a membership to New England Historical Genealogical Society. And um, that happens to be kind of a destination worthy world-class resource um, for any kind of genealogical research. Um, but history broadly, um, focusing not only on New England's history, but um, migration patterns. Um, there's a wide range of things one could kind of jump into um, in terms of research. So my genealogical project started there, but what started as um, kind of a personal interest in my family's history soon became a very different project when I came across the events that I ended up writing about my book. It wasn't long before I realized I um, had a connection to a Plymouth Colony governor who oversaw as judge one of the first uh, criminal jury trials in this country. And um, the trial was significant for a number of different reasons, which I'll go into um, and speak about at length. Um, but just a quick overview. Um, so we're all on, this, on the same page about what those events that transpired were. Um, to set the stage a little bit, these events took place outside of Plymouth Colony in 1638. Um, this is a difficult, tumultuous period of our history during the Pequot War, which took place from 1636 to 1638 um, and had Mass Bay Colony um, battling um, Pequot tribes people. Um, in 1638, at the end of summer, outside of Plymouth Colony in a desolate wooded area, a gang of four escaped indentured servants encountered a Nipmuc tribesman who was on a trading mission for the Narragansett. He was trading beaver pelts for wampum, which was the currency at the time. And um, when this group of four indentured servants encountered um, this trader who at the time was called Penawanyanquis. They did not interact with him when they first encountered him in the woods, but um, the ringleader of this gang of indentured servants, a man named Arthur Peach, originally from Ireland, said to his fellow um, companions in the woods that evening, um, he said, he shared his plan. He said, I'm going to rob him and take what he has from him. Um, and sure enough, the next day when Pinawanyanquis traversed that same desolate wooded path another time, um, Arthur Peach, the leader of, of this gang of four, uh, waved Pinawanyanquis over to his um, fireside encampment in the woods. 
And it wasn't long before Peach, in an attempt to rob him, and also um, possibly motivated out of other reasons, um, shouting kind of hateful words toward his murder victim, um, indeed robbed Pinawanyanquis, stole what he had from him, which at that point was wampum, the beaver pelts had been traded, and um, brutally attacked Pinawanyanquis, who survived long enough to escape and um, took refuge in a nearby swamp and uh, survived overnight until he was encountered later by Narragansett tribesmen who were in the area, who um, the Narragansett then called on uh, Roger Williams, the founder of Providence, Rhode Island, to come out into the woods and help come to the aid of this dying man, Penawanyanquis. And Roger Williams did just that. He brought two doctors with him. They rushed um, through the night until they were able to find Penawanyanquis. And in a remarkable moment, Penawanyanquis was able to make a dying declaration and identify his murderers um, and or attackers but not long after Pinawanyank was to come to his injuries and died. And um, from there, my book follows not just that initial attack and murder, but the remarkable manhunt that followed. And it took um, quite a bit of effort to track down these murderers who at that point had absconded um, further into the woods and had traveled all the way um, to present day Newport. And, um, from there, um, once the murderers were apprehended and one of the four did get away, um, but the other three were apprehended and brought to criminal trial back in Plymouth Colony. And kind of the third part of my book looks at that criminal jury trial and why it was so important and how it kind of played a role in not just ending the Pequot War that was possibly going to be reignited by this, um, vicious murder, but also had a hand in kind of stabilizing a difficult moment for Plymouth Colony, which at the time um, was struggling, both economically being outpaced um, by Mass Bay Colony, um, but also suffering kind of a low population. The population of Plymouth Colony at the time was about 550 people. Um, but beyond all of that, I also wanted to kind of shine a very bright light on why a jury trial might be so important to a group of settlers and why jury trials are important to our democracy to this day. And I, I look at all of those questions and all of those answers um, in shaping my book because um, I, I was startled to circle back to kind of my initial research at NEHGS and uh, the research that got me so motivated to write this book and tell this story, one of the first things I came across in digging into the story was this document that showed that in the earliest days of the settlement of Plymouth Colony, this is, I think, December 27th, 1623, um, you have then Plymouth Colony Governor William Bradford order that jury trials are going to be held for any significant criminal issue. And to set the stage a little bit, um, when the Plymouth Colony settlers first came over um, on the Mayflower, that first winter, um, about 98% of them got very sick. Two people did not, um, but the vast majority became ill, half died. Um, the remaining settlers who lived, um, lots of children and um, some others, uh, continued to grow the settlement and kind of, um, it was a hand to mouth subsistence, subsistence situation of survival in those early years where they were so greatly aided by the Wampanoag people. But in 1623, it was still a moment of trials, of, of difficult challenges and starvation. Um, so for someone in the dead of winter, in a moment of starvation and death to sit down and write an order for jury trials, it struck me um, as someone who's practiced law and someone who served on a criminal jury trial as a juror as fascinating. And I wanted to answer that question, why, why in a moment where you have nothing else, would you declare your passion for a jury trial? What is it that motivates you in that moment? And 
the answer to that question is in my book and it really has everything to do about the power of democracy and what we lose when our democracy is shortchanged or marginalized in any way. So I can go into that a little bit more, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the research and kind of dig into that a little bit and um, something I was able to uncover. And um, I've got a slide up. Um, this is just the cover of the book, uh, which I'll just note that it features the Mystic Fort Massacre. So anyone who's familiar with um, the Pequot War will know it was a uh, terrible, ruthless, bloody war um, where Bay Colony soldiers exacted um, attempts at genocide against the Pequot tribe. And you'll see in this Mystic Fort scene, um, fire. And this was the ultimate kind of weapon of mass destruction that was used. And um, when um, this kind of fence, which at the time was called a palisade, was um, kind of a defensive feature of like, as you, as you would use for a fort. Um, but the settlers turned it to their dark advantage um, using fire within um, this mystic fort. And I was able to uh, visit Mashantucket Pequot Research Center, which is a fabulous resource for anyone who's in Connecticut. It is, I think it might be currently closed for the pandemic, but hopefully reopening soon. But um, it's a treasure trove of information about the Pequot um, in this period and then through the centuries and present day. So it's a wonderful resource. And there's a professor there who had, has done a tremendous amount of archeological work on the Pequot War. So I was able to incorporate some really interesting um, finds through his archeological efforts. I was able to go, uh, I was lucky to take one of my kids with me and we went out into the field into an archeological dig and we got to see firsthand some of the interesting finds. And um, one that I'll mention quickly is, um, each tribe at the time had um, kind of a distinctive shape for an arrowhead or, um, uh, so anyway, um, I have, um, actually images are not included of that in, in the book, unfortunately, but, um, but it is something, maybe I'll add an image to my website. You get this very um, upfront kind of close detail when you're able to see firsthand actual items that were used during this period. Um, by the Pequot. So anyway, that's um, right in Connecticut and it's still a wonderful re research resource. Um, and I was fortunate in writing the book to work with Bill and Kristen Keegan who are historical geographers out of Connecticut. And um, what they do is, is just remarkable. They go right into the archives and do tremendous amounts of research. So what looks like a fairly straightforward map um, reflects, I, I can't even imagine how much time both in creating the map, but in the archives, looking through records to recreate what this coastline, um, what the topography would have looked like at the time. So if you see this dark little oval shape, that's the swamp. Um, you can see this dotted line shows the uh, woodland trail that the Peach Gang was on when they attacked Penawaniaquis. This was a swamp where Penawaniaquis hid at New England Historical Genealogical Society. I was able to use um, a 19th century history book of the region that documented that there was an island within that swamp at the time of the attack and into the um, 17th and 18th century. Um, the island is gone now. But I was able to use a lot of resources to kind of really jump into this place and do some site research. And then of course, having this accurate map um, really helps set the stage for these events. Um, people might know that the coastline um, almost 400 years ago looked very different. And um, trying to see where, um, if we can see where Kingston is on this map, but, but you can see that um, for folks who are local to this event, um, you're very close. Um, we have Plymouth here, 
Carswell is the estate where um, Arthur Peach escaped from as an indentured servant. And I can talk a little bit more about um, what indentured servants were, what their circumstances were like. Um, their living conditions were poor, um, if not brutal. And they were mostly men, occasionally women who came over for usually a period of about seven years. There's lots of written indenture contracts um, where they agreed to room and board um, with a promise of land at the end of their term, which rarely panned out. But um, Arthur Peach was one of these indentured servants. So anyway, the, the map is kind of a helpful place setter for the events of the murder, um, manhunt and trial. Um, and then I'm gonna flip through here. This um, is the signing of the Mayflower Compact, which is kind of this agreement to enter into a civil bod body politic um, where the folks in the Mayflower are saying, you know, we're gonna form together and um, cooperate. And um, even though they were landing um, in an unexpected spot. Um, so this is really what I wanted to share with everyone. This is from the collection at RISD. Um, this is a Pequot tribesman. And I, I think it's a fascinating portrait. This is through European eyes of um, what a Pequot tribesman at the time looked like. Um, for a long time, scholars thought this was uh, Ninigrit, the sachem of the Niantic, but um, that's been corrected and it's now recognized to be a Pequot tribesman. And circling back to my research, um, one of the research finds I'm most proud of is the discovery of a young boy um, who features um, in a critical role in my book and his name was Will. Will lived in the home of Roger Williams. So again, Roger Williams, founder of Providence, Rhode Island, and the person who takes this dying declaration from the murder victim, Pinawan Yanquist. And in the earliest records, and then in subsequent academic writings about these events, the person who tracks down the murderers on this manhunt through the woods is referred to as a messenger. And when I spent kind of the first year working on this project and creating a proposal to see if there was kind of enough to write a book, I took it at face value that there was a messenger. And I kind of left it at that. I had so many other avenues of research to pursue. And after about a, a year, knowing that I wanted to write a narrative nonfiction book that was rich in detail and really transported the reader, and that was a complete full picture of everyone involved in these events, whether it was a man, a woman, a child, a uh, colony governor, an indentured servant, tribes people, tribes men, tribes women. Uh, I really wanted to create a full global picture of each and every person. And as I went back to the primary sources over and over and over, and again, the, the document I'm thinking of is one written by Roger Williams, and it's pretty detailed. And I've read it hundreds of times, kind of combing through each word to look for a new point of research to recreate these events for the reader, I finally started to look very closely at the word messenger. And I realized that there was someone missing from this story and who might that messenger be? And I thought it was probably a man. I thought it was probably an indentured servant, um, but I was incorrect on all fronts um, because as I kept digging, um, again, this is at least a year into the project, I realized that to my great surprise, the messenger was a child. And he was probably about 10 or 11 years old. And I know he must have been very young because at the time, um, older children who are Pequot were being shipped to Bermuda as prisoners of war, as slaves. Um, so I know he must have been young enough to have escaped that. And um, Will was a slave living in Roger Williams' home. He had requested that um, William, um, Governor Winthrop, rather, from Bay Colony, provide, um, give Roger Williams, this boy, Will. And um, while I don't have an image of Will to share in the book, um, I thought this contemporary of, of Will's 
was as close as we could get. So I, I thought it was important to share it. And um, I was able to try and find out as much as I could about Will's circumstance. Um, this is Governor Winthrop of Bay Colony, present day Boston, who had Will um, in his home before sending the boy to go with Roger Williams. And Roger Williams, oddly, for some reason, asks John Winthrop to name him um, for him. And Winthrop goes ahead and does that. So this is a, a dark, treacherous time for um, Indigenous peoples, for children who are particularly vulnerable. Um, but incredibly, um, Will was able to help apprehend these murderers um, and, and bring them to justice. So it was an unlikely piece of the story, but one I wanted to really shine a light on because it encapsulated to me many things. Um, one, the horrors of the Pequot War, two, the early slave trade in New England, um, the transatlantic slave trade with Africa began in Boston in 1638, um, and also just the unlikely role in, in how this remarkable story of justice came to be. Um, so there's Governor John Winthrop. Um, Here's another image from my book. Um, this is a marker tree. We knew one of the foreign gentured servants who did escape justice. Um, he was tried in absentia, um, but he was able to travel most likely on foot um, to present day Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. Um, if anyone's familiar with kind of that Strawberry Bank area. Um, and these indigenous marker trees often were used to show people the way on um, particular trails. And he may have seen a marker tree heading um, north on that Astandon trek. Um, this is an image I took. This is, um, I have a chapter on the murder victim, Penawani Inquis. Um, one of the few things we know about Penawani Inquis was that in his childhood, he had a vision of the children's god, an um, indigenous deity. And I delved into a little bit um, research that I was able to undertake about what that experience might have been like for him, um, kind of whatever research was available. Uh, one of the things we know about the Nipmuc, again, Penawani Inquis was a um, Nipmuc, was this reverence for nature and um, in particular Manitou stones. And this is an example of one in the woods. Um, and here we, here we are at the end of the images I have to share. If you, it, it's hard to see. And actually I, I took an image of this parchment myself early on in my research. And I, I do have a funny story about that. Um, this document is held at the uh, Plymouth County Registry of Deeds surprisingly perhaps, it's kept in a fireproof vault and it's usually not available to the public. But I went to go see it and it happened that if you were a member of the bar, um, you could see it. And um, indeed I am a member in good standing and I happen to have my bar card with me. That's the card they give you if you're a member of the bar and you can kind of flash it at um, courtroom security lines and get through security. Uh, you don't have to go through security, you can simply walk by. So I was able to show my bar card and get in and see this document um, and take a picture of it. And what it is, if um, people can see the very top paragraph, last line of the first paragraph, it's um, the order of a jury upon their oaths is that last sentence. And I used to photograph these things because it took me a long time to get used to this writing. <laughs> so I would take lots of photographs. I would go home, I would blow them up, and then I would transcribe them word for word until I had um, a transcription that I could work off of. When I provided my publisher with my photograph, she she said, you know, there's, there's no way you can include this. It's dark and blurry and I'm not a very good photographer. So I was very lucky to, um, at that point, you know, I thought to myself, 
no one ever gets to see this document and it's so foundational to our jurisprudence. And if there's any way I can get this into the book, I would just love it for people to have the chance to see this. So I reached out to a professional photographer who's very um, capable and um, she went out and worked with the very uh, gracious folks at the Registry of Deeds who are very busy with other, <laughs> um, other work that they have, but they allowed her to take this. Um, her name is Anne Lefrev. Lefrev, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and this is her photograph and you can see more clearly um, this order in a moment of grueling conditions and starvation, um, highlighting the importance of a jury and, and um, a little glimpse into why a jury might be so important. And um, I, I can just say quickly, that the settlers who left England behind were people who had been um, tortured, physically branded, um, thrown into dungeons and to be forgotten about. Um, all actions that were kind of rubber stamped um, through courts without juries. And you can imagine if you were someone who realized that a jury of your peers could well be the ultimate, the very last possible safeguard against horrific injustice. When you finally found yourself with a chance at liberty, it might be one of the first things that you um, want to establish. And, and here they did just that. Um, what I do try and shine a very bright light on is that for all, um, the focus on liberty and these wonderful nascent building blocks of our beautiful democracy. There were um, barbaric actions against indigenous people and that those very actions and not extending these rights to indigenous peoples um, undermined the very liber liberties that they so cherished. So there's kind of this dark irony there, but, um, but I was eager to hang a light on all of that. And um, I can at this point do a couple of different things. I can read a little bit from the book or I'm happy to answer any questions that, um, that people might have. We could do both if you like, or if anybody does, does have any questions they'd like to ask now, you are welcome to un unmute yourself and, and, and ask questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Go right ahead. Um, so I was also drawn to your book uh, because of a genealogy reason. Um, I believe I'm a direct descendant of Daniel Cross. And um, one of the things that you said in your book that um, was new to me was you thought that he was an indentured servant? I, yes, I, I think I do have it that he was an indentured servant. The, um, so I'd, I'd be interested in seeing more about what, what that is. I, I noticed there was a footnote that um, said that, that, you know, the escapee's master or something like that, but uh, I tried to track those things down and they didn't seem to point directly to him having a, a master. Uh, and I had the impression that he was, um, as Bradford described, uh, somebody who was among the, the people that had been around New England uh, for 15 or more years and had been trading with, with Indians or natives, I should say. Um, and if he did become an indentured servant, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing to whom and how that happened. That's a great question. I'm happy to look into it more and, and message you. I don't know if um, you're welcome to reach out to me on my website and I could okay. certainly look into it more. The group of four are widely referred to as indentured servants, but um, whether his indenture had concluded at that time, um, that's yeah. certainly possible. And I'm happy to look into that more. Well, he, he first came to New England in 1622 to Monhegan Island with his brothers. And um, in the end, um, his... Uh, a widow and children ended up moving in with his brother Robert in Ipswich. 
um, but I, I hadn't heard that he was an indentured servant at any time. Well, it's an interesting question. Um, the group of four are widely referred to as indentured servants, um, but if for some reason he somehow circumvented that and ended up in Plymouth Colony, and I can think of possible reasons. Um, was why trading with them. Sure, um, but for whatever reason, he escaped into the woods with Arthur Peach in the night and um, it's widely held that the four were indentured servants, but I'm happy to look into it more and, and certainly kind of correspond with you and see if we can get to the bottom of it. Okay, well, I'll go to your website and leave a contact information. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? If, if, if you do want to read a portion, sure. uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, so I'm going to read um, just a short passage from the chapter on the actual murder. Um, Adrenaline surely rising, Penawan Yanquis sprinted and tripped through the warm, murky water farther into the depths of the swamp. Thick clumps of impenetrable reeds sliced his ankles. The injuries erupted in blinding pain. Blood gushed from his stomach wounds into dark liquid clouds around him as his body sank. One last time, Pinawanyank was heard them close by him and tried to elude his pursuers. He ventured even farther into the swamp till he fell down again when they lost him quite. Pinawanyank was himself was likely quite lost at this point and critically injured. He prayed for help. The dense vegetation obscured the sun and any means of navigation and the enormous lush leaves of stinking skunk cabbage plants underfoot emitted an unpleasant dizzying heat. Penawan Yanquis left no record of the hours he spent hiding in the swamp, but a fellow Algonquin man born in the 18th century wrote about the panic he himself felt after getting lost in a similarly impassable environment. Shut out from the light of heaven, surrounded by appalling darkness, standing on uncertain ground and having proceeded so far that to return if possible were as dangerous as to go over. This was the hour of peril. I could not call for assistance on my fellow creatures. There was no mortal ear to listen to my cry. I was shut out from the world and did not know that but I should perish there and my fate forever remain a mystery to my friends. And so it was for Penawan Yanquis. He was out of reach of Peach's rapier, but he remained lost, injured, and disoriented in a nightmarish scene. Um, and that's an example of um, one, a, a lot of different research that went into identifying what that environment was like. Um, but it's also a, a, an example of something I call parallel research, where I hang a light on the reader that I'm going to provide a little description um, in this case by a fellow Algonquin man born in the 18th century who was lost, almost dying in a swamp. Um, so while we don't have Pinawan Yanquist's direct words at that moment, um, we're able to kind of get a glimpse of what that situation might have been like. So I try and paint as uh, realistic and accurate a picture as possible. There any any questions? Um, in the meantime, I actually I know you already addressed it, but um, I have a mind like a sieve and I can't really retain much. Uh, you mentioned the cover of your book with the, the palisades and, and, yeah. and is that based on a specific location. The, um, the cover of your book. Sure. Um, this is the uh, Mystic Court Massacre. And um, if you go today, this was, um, I think, one of our uh, bloodiest battles in American history. I know there are historians who um, would point to Civil War battles, Antietam, um, et cetera, but this was uh, a horrific um, loss of life. Um, if you go to Connecticut and you look at local maps, um, kind of the accessible maps that you might find of the area. Um, not all will have the site marked. And I've heard kind of different opinions from different folks about 
why some of these battle sites are not as um, not as well marked as they might be, um, kind of hidden. I, I think there is a small plaque um, somewhere for this one, but um, but it, it is a little bit of a tricky thing to actually identify that that particular battle site. Is there any reason why it, like some of them won't reference it? Is it just because it happened so long ago, or is there another reason why it just doesn't get into every source that you look at? Sure, um, I have heard uh, an indigenous speaker um, who, I, I don't wanna quote him without his words in front of me, but who certainly seemed to imply that um, something more intentional than that, um, that this is, you know, we think of our origin narrative and we think of um, those stories we hear in history class that are, um, kind of glowing moments of history and, and our origin narrative is, is, is very flawed and these battles are gruesome and they don't always fit nicely into the stories that are shared with children and um, history class. And um, it might not be, uh, you know, I, I would leave it to folks in Connecticut to kind of respond to um, why certain battle sites are not very well marked and, and um, identified. Seems like that could be a move uh, for people to encourage, you know, that they yeah. not be excluded from the history of that, of that region. But yes. yeah, that's never that easy. Well, um, unless anybody else has any, has any more questions uh, for Ms. Pearl, um, now is the time to ask them. Um, I, I, do want to thank you for uh, talking about your book tonight. And um, I have not got a chance to read it yet. That uh, stack of books on my nightstand is growing more and more by the day, but it's something that I am looking forward to reading. Um, so thank you so much for coming out. And um, if there aren't any other questions, I guess uh, you're all free to make the long trip from the couch to the uh, <laughs> room or wherever you're going. And also, um, for those of you who are interested, we do have a couple more author talks this month. Um, on the 21st, we have uh, Frederick Logueville talking about uh, his book about JFK. And then a week after that, uh, Ted Widmer and uh, Lincoln on the Verge. So if you're interested, those are all free and they will all be on Zoom. So, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, do we have a question? Elizabeth, do you have a question? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, Toby, I'm, I'm wondering if you can, uh, give us an idea of the places where you uh, found documentation. So that where, what um, archives or libraries or institutions did you research at? That's a fabulous question. Um, Mass Historical Society was invaluable. Um, I've already mentioned NHGS. Um, American Antiquarian Society was um, very helpful. Pick Pilgrim Hall Museum, um, going to local archives in the area in Situate as well. Um, the time I spent at Meshantucket Pequot Research Center. Um, some research I did uh, reaching out to um, Dartmouth College has some wonderful holdings and an archivist <clears throat> was able to send me a letter written by a Nipmuc woman so that was very helpful. So some, I did kind of driving around New England and visiting archives. And um, some of this is transcribed, which is very helpful if you're writing or researching about this very early period. A lot of the records have been transcribed and are accessible online. But I was very lucky um, to be able to kind of go around Boston and go to state archives and do that digging. and. Um, uh, the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds. They have a, a smaller kind of annex office. And um, surprisingly, they have some more holdings there, um, a Plymouth Colony scrapbook. So I was able to kind of mine a lot of different um, letters and journals and transcribed records to kind of paint a picture quoting primary sources to fill in the details about what happened. Great, thank you. I think uh, Bill, do you have I a have question? A, I have a question. 
was choosing the jewelry similar to it, the way it's done today? That's a fabulous question. No, it was entirely different. And uh, a big part of my book tries to answer that exact question because um, today um, we are, when we choose a jury, it's, you know, you receive something in the mail and it's, it's very random who gets to serve on a, on a jury as they're called. And of course there can be some challenges against jurors, but um, as we get our summons, it's, it's a very random process about who is called in on any given day. Um, at the time I mentioned earlier, Plymouth Colony had about 550 people living there in 1638 and 17% of the population uh, were indentured servants who were not eligible for jury duty and uh, women and children and um, people, uh, many people were not eligible. Um, and also um, the leadership in the colony, Miles Standish, who um, handled uh, training the troops for the colony. Um, anyone who had that kind of leadership role or religious leadership role was also deemed ineligible um, that they might have a conflict. So there were very few people who were eligible for jury service. And then of that group, there was no pretense about randomly selecting from that small remaining population of, of people. Rather, they wanted to find the smartest, the brightest, the most well-read. Um, there was something kind of of an honor to it. So they wanted um, to find the most um, esteemed people to serve men in this case, as women could not serve at that time, um, the most esteemed people to serve on the jury. So when we look at who actually ended up serving on this jury um, of this murder trial, it was very, 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 very carefully curated. And, um, and there's kind of a whole backstory involving, some people may know the name Lothrop, um, many of his disciples ended up filling the seats of, of on that jury trial. And there's a lot of reasons that go into that, but it turned out to be kind of the most fascinating elements of, of the book and the research um, was figuring out why were there so many Lothrop disciples on that jury? And um, there were a lot of reasons for that. And I think it did shift the outcome of that trial. So it's, it's fascinating because it's something we still look at today day um, when we see the outcome of, of a significant jury trial and we look at who the jurors were and why they might have voted the way um, or decided the way that they did. And um, one other thing that was very helpful, just going back to research, um, I was able to look at probate records for many of the jurors and, um, and Lothrop and other people to figure out what they were reading because their books were kept. Um, in their probate records, in their wills, they would um, leave their books, their library collections to their heirs. So it was um, one way to get a sense of their thought process and what they were thinking about, what ideas they were considering at the time they served on these juries, um, on this particular jury, was to look at what was sitting on their bedside table, what were they reading at night. And not to spoil the end of the book, but, but how did this end the war? It's a great question. Um, so at the time, um, this was end of July, 1638, the height of summer. Um, the jury trial took place September 4th, 1638. And about two and a half weeks later, after the outcome of the trial, I won't spoil it, but um, shortly after the jury verdict was announced, um, about two and a half weeks, their uh, Pequot War ended by treaty resolution. And um, when the murder first happened, you see writing um, letters sent by um, William Bradford and um, uh, words documented from Nian Tonomo, who was the sachem of Narr Narragansett, all attesting to this terrible concern um, that this murder was going to reignite the battles of the Pequot War. Um, William Bradford urging, you know, if, if we don't somehow find justice here, um, a war will be raised. And he was kind of referring to that 
um, the Pequot War battles being reignited rather than quelled as um, the hope had been before this murder took place. Uh, does anybody have any other more questions? Well, I have one other sort of quick technical one, and that is, uh, can you point me to the sources that talked about the extradition requests to uh, Piscataqua to, to get Daniel Cross? Uh, where did that, where did you find that? Sure, uh, that's carefully documented in my notes. Um, I want to say that it was William Bradford who said that the folks in Pis Piscataqua refused us, um, but that's very carefully documented. Um, so that, that will be very easy to point you to and can be seen in my end notes. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the notes and um, I'm not a librarian, so they, they seem hard to, hard to identify which note is that thing. Well, if you look at the start of the sentence, the first three words of the sentence you're looking at right. um, will start the citation in the end notes. And I'm, I'm happy to set up a phone call to certainly go over any end notes. Um, but that's something that's also been widely transcribed on the internet. Um, but it, it is certainly there in my end, end notes as well. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, again, thank you very much. Uh... For, for coming out tonight and, and speaking about this. Um, wow. Um, thank you all for coming out and uh, hope to see you all in a couple more weeks. And um, thank you. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so very much for having me. It was an honor and, and a real pleasure too. Oh, you, you, you make us look good by giving such great programs. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you again. Yes. Well, thank you everyone. And uh,